Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome to day 6 of AWS Zero to Hero series. Before I start with today's video, I would like to make a very small request. That is, if you find the videos on our channel informative and if you are learning from our channel, then please subscribe to the channel. The reason why I'm asking is only 60% of our regular viewers have actually subscribed to the channel. So if you haven't done it, please do it today. Now let's go back to the topic for today that is route 53 in today's video we will try to understand what exactly is route 53 and why you need route 53 on aws route 53 on aws provides dns as a service now what exactly is dns dns basically stands for domain name system Okay, so DNS stands for domain name system and route 53 provides you DNS as a service that is domain name system as a service to understand this in a very simple way when you use EC2 basically AWS provides through EC2 compute as a service. If you are using EKS AWS provides you elastic Kubernetes that is Kubernetes as a service. Similarly, when you use route 53 AWS provides you DNS as a service. But what exactly is DNS? Now, when I say this, probably this is a question that is running in your mind. What exactly is DNS? So on a day to day basis, all of us use DNS. Probably some of you are aware, some of you are not aware, but DNS is something that we keep using. For example, on a day to day basis, we use uh, amazon.com right uh, let's say we use uh, something like uh, flipkart.com when you use these things you are directly or indirectly actually using dns so when we use any application right so in the previous classes what we discussed was when we deploy application or even when we deployed applications like Jenkins or when we deployed a simple Python application in the previous classes, what we did was basically we created a VPC and inside the VPC, basically uh, either you create a public and private subnet. Okay. And inside the private subnet, basically you have your application and in the public subnet, you have load balancer. And before that, there are a lot of configurations. But if we just start from here, Basically, you have load balancer, which is getting the request and from the load balancer, the request goes to your app or if you don't have the load balancer itself, directly your request goes to your application. But whether it is application or whether it is load balancer, when you create these things on AWS or to that matter of fact on your on premises or anywhere in the world, basically they get assigned with an IP address, right? What do they get assigned with? They get assigned with IP address, but we never use IP addresses in real world right do you ever happen to use an ip address for accessing a public application for example if you want to use amazon.com or flipkart.com or you want to use anything like uh, instagram or anything you never actually use ip addresses but you actually use something called as domain names so what are these things amazon.com or flipkart.com these are domain names so when you use domain name Okay, when I say you use domain names, but this domain name has to be eventually converted to the IP address, right? See, if this domain name is tagged to load balancer, let's say, or if this domain name is tagged to this application, someone has to convert this domain name to either the IP address of load balancer or the IP address of your application. Who is that? That is basically a DNS service. So DNS service is the one that maps your domain name with the IP address or DNS is the one that resolves your domain name to the IP address. If you assign the domain name to the load balancer, DNS is the one that resolves the domain name to the load balancer IP address. If you assign uh, the domain name to the uh, application's IP address, then DNS is the one that resolves the domain name to the IP address of your application. But in real world scenario, basically, DNS resolves domain name to the load balancer IP address only. When we access IRCTC.com or when we access uh, Amazon.com, Flipkart.com, anything, there you are trying to resolve the load balancer IP address using the domain name itself. And the one who does this is DNS. Now, saying that, 
how does the actual configuration would look like, right? Because in the previous classes, I have never explained you about Route 53 or DNS, but it's a very simple concept. What we have learned till now previously was, again, if we draw that picture, basically this is the VPC that DevOps engineer has created. And inside the VPC, like I told you, first there will be an uh, ingress gateway or internet gateway, right? After that, basically you have uh, a public subnet, let's assume. And then you have a private subnet, let's say. And this is very common, like I told you. In the private subnet, you have your applications. One application, two application, whatever you would like to. And in the public subnet, you have all of these things, like you have your load balancer, you have your NAT gateway, all of these things. Let's say load balancer is here, and this is here. I've told you many times in the past that from load balancer, request would go to the application in real terms. And before this, what basically happens is when you create load balancer, when the DevOps engineer creates VPC and creates all of these configurations, which we will do in the next class, when you create the load balancer, AWS gives this load balancer a IP address. And let's say you have a user here who is trying to access this application through the load balancer. You cannot give this user IP address of the load balancer. There are two reasons. There can be multiple reasons, but two primary reasons is this IP address can be very difficult to remember also, right? So let's say the load balancer is assigned with an IP address called 3.6.10.171. Is this IP address easy to remember or a domain name such as Amazon.com is easy to remember? Let's say you are DevOps engineer working at Amazon.com. Instead of sharing them, this IP address, it will be very easy to share them the domain name. That is, okay, access my application on Amazon.com. Instead of saying access my application on 3.6.10.171. And if you keep remember remembering these IP addresses, for each application, you have to remember IP address, which is practically not possible. It is very easy for us to remember the names. So that is one reason. And the second reason is the IP address can anytime change, right? IP address can be subjected to change. Let's say tomorrow you have restarted your load balancer and you have not assigned a static IP address or tomorrow you are you don't have a load balancer itself. Let's say you are doing a college project or your home project. In general, you don't use a load balancer and you have your application running on your laptop, for example. So next time when you start, your IP address will change depending upon your home network and it might keep changing. So because IP address can be static or IP address can be dynamic. So to solve again this problem, it is very simple to remember the domain names. That's why every company or any application that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, you try to access them only on the domain name. Now, I hope you understood what is DNS, right? So there has to be some service in general that looks at the domain name and says that, okay, this DNS basically keeps records, okay? So what does DNS do? DNS basically keeps a lot of records. I'm just explaining you in a very basic terms. DNS is complicated topic. If we go into the details of DNS, there are multiple things in the DNS. Like for example, DNS has a lot of, uh, you know, registration process for it. I'll come there, but for basic understanding, DNS keeps a lot of records. Okay, there are a lot of servers and there are records that basically maps this domain name to the IP address. Now, what AWS does is AWS says, okay, I will provide this DNS as a service. Now you might be thinking, okay, why do I need to do that? Uh, I can set up my own DNS, but DNS is a very complicated thing. There are multiple things that gets involved in DNS for a basic understanding, for basic example, I can simply explain you. Let's say today you have written an application on your personal laptop and to make this application available to outside world using the domain name, what are things that you have to do is firstly, probably you will go to GoDaddy or some domain seller. And firstly, you will try to buy a domain name that is, for example, if this application is called as abhishek.com, so firstly, you will search for abhishek.com. If you don't have abhishek.com, probably you will search for abhishek.in. If you don't have that, probably you will search for abhishek.cricket, something like that, or abhishek.xyz. Finally, you will buy a domain, and then once you buy a domain, you also need a hosting solution. 
probably you'll go to hostinger or somewhere and again you will take a hosting solution and then there has to be some dns records that have to be maintained all the time okay so to solve all of these things what aws said is okay don't bother about all of those things if you are hosting your application on the aws platform within the vpc or somewhere we will provide you something called as route 53 okay now if we try to understand the architecture there is one simple change that will be added to our previous diagram, which we have been drawing, that is in front of the load balancer. If this is the public subnet and this is the load balancer, and let's say this is the internet gateway, you know, there will be something called as route 53. Okay, let's call it as R53. And whenever a request comes from the user, let's say user is trying to access amazon.com. So route 53 is the one which intercepts the request. It checks in its DNS records. Okay, what is the request? It will try to resolve the DNS name to the IP address of the load balancer. And from there, the process is same. Okay, this is how route 53 works. But to configure route 53, you need to do a lot of things. So in AWS, for route 53, there are some critical things. First is basically the domain registration itself. Let's say as a DevOps engineer, you have configured everything. And finally, now if your application is about to be live, let's say you are doing it for the first time. The very first thing that you have to do is you have to take a domain registration. That is exactly same, right? Uh, as I told you, you would probably before AWS, you will go to GoDaddy or you will go somewhere else and you would have purchased the domain name. But what AWS says is, don't worry, you can purchase the domain name from me as well. Okay, so AWS also sells the domain names or AWS says that, okay, no problem. You can buy the domain name somewhere else and I can also integrate that within the Route 53. Okay, so one is either you can purchase the domain name from AWS or if you already have the domain name that you have purchased, let's say two years back, three years back from GoDaddy, then Route 53 also says that, okay, no problem. Either you can do the domain registration with me or outside. If you do it outside, then you need to create something called as hosted zones. I mean, in either of the case, you have to do hosted zones. Whether you buy uh, Route 53, sorry, whether you buy domain from domain registration service of uh, Route 53 or you buy it outside, what you need to do is you have to take a couple of things from here, okay? And you have to put those things in the hosted zone. When we do this practically, you will understand this in a much better way. In hosted zone, you basically create the DNS records. This is exactly where all your DNS mapping and all the things in future when you make a request, like I told you, the request is intercepted by Route 53. Firstly, it will see, okay, did I register this domain or is this register domain coming from outside? In any of the cases, Route 53 goes to the hosted zone. There can be public or private hosted zone, which we will talk later. But request goes to the hosted zone. And in the hosted zone, this Route 53 will look for DNS records. Okay. If this information is met in the DNS records, Route 53 will resolve your DNS name to IP address. And from there, the request goes ahead. Okay. So what are the two things that we have learned now? One is there is in Route 53, there is something called as domain registration where you can buy your domain in AWS. This is not, you know, a pay and go kind of service. Whereas if you use domain registration, you will pay AWS upfront and you will purchase the domain. Then what is the second thing that I said is the hosted zones in the hosted zone. Basically you will take all the DNS records. Okay. In the hosted zones, you will say, okay, this is domain name and this is IP address. This is domain name and this is IP address. I'm saying it very high level. If we go internally, there will be additional things. There will be routing policies and a lot of other things. But at this point of time, I'm not covering them. We will do when we do the practical projects. Okay. And apart from both of these things, one is domain registration and hosting hosted zones. Route 53 also supports something called as health checks. Okay. Route 53 basically you know, when it resolves all of these IP addresses and some things, at the same time, Route 53 can also perform health check on the web applications. 
okay or the web servers so let's say your application is hosted on uh, two different availability zones on two different web servers so what route 53 can do is it can simultaneously check the health of these web servers it can like you know every one minute every five minutes it can send the request to the web servers and see if this web server is active or not okay if this web server is active then route 53 will or can forward the uh, request in future to this web server if this is active then it can forward to this web server if both of them are active then you know route 53 performs some kind of uh, balancing don't worry uh, at this point of time just understand that using route 53 you can do domain domain registration and using route 53 you can update the dns records using hosted zones also route 53 can perform some kind of health checks so this is enough uh, for us to go forward and do the practical project so till now we have done all the concepts like we have covered an overview of the concepts of vpc the important ones and what we will do tomorrow is we will try to perform a project we will do the same thing that we kept on repeating like this project we will try to build where we will create a public private subnet and we will try to access the application using all of these vpc components in day five we did a project but there we only use the public subnet and we use security groups and we try to access it but in tomorrow's project, it will be a very full-fledged project, which most of the companies use. And even this is something that is constantly asked in interviews. Have you implemented the public-private subnet architecture in AWS? What exactly is it? How does the traffic flow within the VPC? And how your end application actually gets the request? So this is something that we will try to learn and we will try to implement in the next class. We have already learned it. We have also learned the components of VPC. Now we are up for the practical project and tomorrow's class we will implement that project we will try to do as simple as possible in terms of explanation so i will try to go into the details and explain you each and every detail i hope you enjoyed today's video and you got a overview of what route 53 is and if you want to learn more about route 53 don't worry, AWS has a wonderful documentation about Route 53, where you can understand Route 53 in very detail with a lot of practical examples. So you don't have to go anywhere. Just go to the AWS documentation if you want to learn more about Route 53 today. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.